Hi everyone, my name is Ron, and uh, I'm a technical lead in a company called Yopo. And today I'm going to talk about productionizing real-time serving with uh, ML Flow. And uh, first I'm going to give a little bit of uh, context to why we are actually using ML Flow and ML Flow serving. And then we're going to diverge a little bit and talk about uh, the challenges with uh, machine learning in production. And I'm guessing some of you guys are already familiar with, uh, with that topic. And uh, lastly, we're going to dive into MFL serving, talk about why I think it's awesome and uh, what we actually did to make it production ready. So a little bit about uh, who we are. Yopo is a company uh, founded back in 2011 and uh, is based in Israel. And our mission is uh, to help e-commerce brands all over the world create a better and more seamless consumer experience and, and by offering a one-stop shop e-commerce marketing platform. So essentially, we incorporate uh, a rather common solutions in the e-commerce uh, uh, space, such as reviews and ratings, visual marketing, loyalty and referral programs, and also uh, SMS marketing as of late. And the, the actual use case we're going to focus on is uh, uh, deploying image processing models and, and utilize them uh, as REST APIs for our visual uh, marketing product. And our visual marketing product, our visual mar marketing product, actually, um, we let our customer combines, combine photo, videos, and reviews to create uh, an on-site uh, product galleries and uh, essentially just leverage any visual content that they have in order to create a better on-site experience and, and more engaging uh, marketing campaigns. So within that product, we have an admin model, which you can actually manage this entire operation. And, and we essentially, we let our uh, customers pull images from Instagram and, uh, and then filter those images out based on certain properties. And those properties can be like dominant colors. Does this image contain people? What is the image quality? Does it, is it noisy? Does it have a lower resolution? Is this shot taken outdoor or indoor? And we actually uh, build a model to detect if there are smiling people in the image because uh, in theory, it's supposed to be a, like a better converting image. And so you get the picture here. Essentially, we want to build like as many machine learning models that we can and we wanted to deploy them to production fast and in a uniform and kind of, kind of a seamless way. So we let our user uh, um, uh, filter those images out and then uh, essentially just chooses which images he wants to display on its uh, 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 widget uh, gallery. So we understand the use case, right? So let's just make it happen. And uh, essentially, uh, we can just let uh, make it happen. It's a, uh, it's a quite uh, a difficult challenge uh, that is well known in the in the machine learning and data world. And this image has been taken from a, a research conducted by Google back in 2015, and it emphasizes that there's your machine learning code or your ML uh, uh, model has very little to do with the su a successful machine learning to run in a production environment, right? So you have like a mass uh, 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 and a vast around infrastructure that you would need to uh, actually build in order to support this kind of uh, application. Not only that the technical challenges are quite large, you have like a, a very, um, you have this entire operation distributed across multiple teams and contexts. And there's a lot of points then this, that this can go wrong, right? So this image has been taken from one of the most influential articles in the past uh, two years. Uh, called Continuous Delivery for Machine Learning and credit for the Martin Fowler blog. And I strongly recommend that you would read it. Uh, for me, it was a real eye opener. And it emphasizes that uh, essentially you have your data engineers that, that's supposed to bring the data in and, and make it available for the data scientists. They should actually write the training code, build the model and pass it down to our uh, machine learning engineers. And they would need to create a web application uh, and deploy it to production. And there's a lot of places and this uh, thing can go wrong. And we want to actually decouple this entire uh, organization uh, mess, right? So just to sum up real quick, um, we have a vast and complex multi-layered infrastructure that we need to build. It's, it's surrounding with the data pro processing, with feature extraction, extraction 
training infrastructure, in, in our case, the serving infrastructure, we want to build models and we want to uh, 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 utilize them as REST APIs. And we want to do it again and again in a seamless way. Also, we talked about the organizational problem. problem. If you are a strong believer in self-contained teams and you want to have a, a, a full accountability and ownership of any project that you uh, that you do from the from a research phase up until to production phase, um, you would need the uh, the certain infrastructure to support this uh, setup. If you won't have it, eventually what you would have is uh, these large and cumbersome handovers, right? So when a data science team finishes the project, they do like a handover to the data engineers and Again, this is this kind of uh, uh, being like a waterfall approach to what we want to be more agile and, uh, and uh, easy to do. Okay, so this problem is actually kind of been talked about in the past two years and, and it's coined the term MLOps. And MLOps is basically um, taking the same best practices and, and, and software engineering principles that you would have in any software engineering project and applying, applying those uh, uh, principles to your machine learning uh, in, uh, in data science workflows. So you want to build a generic infrastructure that you would be able to utilize over and over again uh, when you deploy machine learning uh, uh, applications and you would need uh, uh, some sort of uh, unified infrastructure to support this uh, uh, operation. One of the companies that actually identified this problem was uh, Databricks and they the, their solution to this is uh, MLflow. And MLflow is uh, a rather uh, really cool uh, open source uh, project and it's an, a platform for the entire machine learning lifecycle. And we've been using MLflow for uh, a while now and we use it for um, actually tracking our experiments, uh, saving the, the model artifacts, also uh, uh, you can have like a, a, a conventional way to package any uh, machine learning uh, project. And we chose it, we chose MLflow to be the center of our uh, entire MLOps operation. And uh, now we actually wanted to use MLflow serving as our serving infrastructure. MLflow serving is a sub model, actually a, like a sub feature uh, uh, within MLflow, which basically lets you take any model that you save in MLflow and serve it as a REST API. So it's quite generic and, and, and agnostic if you're using the, the Python flavor, which is the, the most generic uh, uh, flavor you can use in MLflow. And the cool thing about it is that we can actually take this uh, uh, feature and automate and streamline the entire uh, model deployment, right? So we can take any model that we build, save it to MLflow, and actually deploy it as a REST API uh, uh, out of the box, right? So this server that you are that you are essentially getting uh, will respond to a predetermined endpoint, the invocations endpoint, and you can pass it a, pass it um, a variety of uh, 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 serialized pandas data frame, and it's really easy to set up and run. Right, you can just uh, use the MLflow CLI, MLflow models serve and pass it uh, 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 the run ID, and voila. You, you, you got a built-in web, web server, which you can query and get predictions. That's kind of cool, right? But essentially, if we want to look at what, what is happening behind the scenes here, MLflow is using a, what they call a scoring server. And they, they create a new scoring server using the scoring server model. And essentially, this code is, is rather simplistic, and it does a couple of straightforward things. One of them is actually loading the model that, that you have given it. So it downloads the artifacts, loading them to memory, initializing the Conda environment so you could actually be able to run predictions and create the Flask code application, which is the, the, the actual code for your web server. And it finds two predetermined endpoints. One of them is the invocations endpoints, which is the actual code that parses the request and passing the, the, the required input to your uh, models for prediction. And the ping endpoint, which is super important if you're running stuff on production. Um, essentially, you, you, wanna, you wanna understand if your server is, uh, is healthy and up and running, and this endpoint will respond 200 if your model has been loaded successfully by MLflow 
and uh, is ready to uh, serve requests. So really, really simple. This is the actual code from, uh, from uh, the YAML flow project. And uh, what you see here is actually initializing the scoring server, uh, passing it the, the loaded model and creating an app. And this app is actually a web server app that is being uh, run by MLflow. So as it turns out, if you look at any like software development lifecycle, any actually web service or any kind of uh, microservice that you would uh, want to build, you want to, firstly, you want to develop and maybe extend and customize the, the way your server behaves, right? So we're getting a built-in web server here and we actually want to make it do other things and, and extend its behavior. We want, to, we want to see how we can do that. After that, we actually want to package our application and, uh, and deploy it. And if you're running in a, in a highly containerized environment in production, like we do, and essentially what you want to do is build a Docker container and be able to deploy it uh, um, on any container orchestration. And then you would actually want to monitor how your server behaves, right? So you want to see uh, your server metrics, you want to see logging, and you want to see uh, your service health. And eventually, if you need to, you want to optimize. You want to scale in, scale out your instances and change maybe instance type and uh, handle timeouts. Maybe you have like an auto scaling mechanism and so on. So um, you probably want to do this entire operation for any kind of uh, uh, service uh, you're running in production. And the premise of it all is I want to treat ML, my MLflow based services just like any other microservice, right? So we have our entire uh, production environment already running uh, for our other uh, production services. Why not utilize it for our MLflow microservices? So if we have already like the centralized infrastructure for uh, a streamlined uh, deployment mechanisms, and maybe we have like um, uh, centralized monitoring and logging. And and maybe we have auto scaling mechanisms so we can like auto scale our, our servers based on anything we choose uh, to measure. Maybe we support the uh, canary and blue green deployment. So this entire production uh, environment setup, it's something we can actually take and apply uh, and to our machine learning uh, projects as well. And so let's uh, talk about how we can actually develop and extend our server behavior. So first we need to understand uh, what are the key components of any MLflow based web server. So firstly, uh, and, and we mentioned it earlier, we are using Flask as, a, as our web application uh, framework. We are the actual code of our endpoints. And uh, Flask is a great project. It's really, really easy to set up and, and, and uh, create web servers with. But the thing is, it's not performant enough as a standalone production server. So this is where the WSGI specification actually comes in handy. And uh, it dictates, it actually dictates that the, there should be a, like a, a clear separation between your operational web server, which actually handles the request and your uh, applicative code uh, uh, that runs uh, uh, eventually. So uh, we are gonna use GUnicron as our WSGI uh, web server and uh, uh, also a widely popular uh, Python project. And it actually what MLflow is being run, running uh, in the background, right? So when you run MLflow serve any model, what you will get essentially behind the scenes is MLflow is gonna run a, a gunicorn command to create, a, a, to run this uh, web server. Okay, so just a real quick example of how a request might look like here. So, uh, Let's say you have an, an Nginx, pro Nginx proxy that will serve static content. So any request that is a, a, of, a, of a static content will be served by this Nginx. Uh, other requests will be forwarded to your GUnicorn uh, web server and eventually to your uh, Flask web application code. And when we are talking about extending the behavior of an already built-in web server, the only thing we can actually do here is adding middleware. And middleware is a rather uh, simple concept in, uh, in any uh, uh, web application in the, in the web development world. And uh, essentially it, uh, it lets you add layers of logic to your uh, request and response. So just an example here, you will get a request, you will add a different logic and code uh, to it. 
you will then pass it down to another layer of middleware and eventually it will hit your uh, uh, MLflow or any other application code and you will send back a response and it will also uh, be moving through your layers of middleware. So you, you can essentially do a lot of things with middleware, but some of the most common examples of, of using it is, uh, is uh, authorization. You can actually, for each request that you're getting, you wanna have it authorized uh, through, I don't know, some kind of third-party service. You can also do request transformation. So what we saw earlier is that we are using the pandas uh, that frame format as our uh, input format for the request, right? So maybe we don't want to expose the fact that we are using uh, pandas that frame, we can actually build a, a, a transformer that will transform your request and and create the pandas data frame automatically for you in the middleware and then pass it through your um, uh, machine learning model. And also monitoring and logging is, is uh, rather the most uh, common use case for middleware. And this is uh, an example for a customer instrumentation. So we, we are in, in Yopo, we are running uh, our production services and they uh, uh, export their metrics using Prometheus. And we wanted to have the same behavior here. We want to have the, our machine learning uh, a web server application also exported metrics using uh, Prometheus. So really, really simple. We're using a built-in uh, uh, open source uh, uh, Python package for uh, uh, Prometheus and Flask. And essentially just after create, creating our uh, 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 web server, we are passing it to our uh, G Unicorn uh, Prometheus middleware, and boom, our server now behaves differently. It exports its metrics using Prometheus. Cool, right? So the next thing we want to do is actually add custom instrumentation. So in the next, the next thing I, I want to do here is uh, basically add a new metric of counting the number of uh, uh, requests I get for each path. So again, something that I'm not getting uh, from MLflow. And, and uh, with a simple five lines of code, I can actually uh, uh, extend its behavior and make it uh, 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 do whatever I want. Okay, so next up, we want to package our application, right? Um, I'm not going to linger too much here, but this essentially, this is a rather generic Docker file for any of our uh, uh, machine learning models. And the, the only thing that changes between projects is the requirements, right? So if you're using that sort of Python uh, flavor uh, framework or using something else, um, essentially the, the only thing that changes between models is, the, is their dependencies, but this entire thing is generic uh, for each uh, project and model that we are using. And the same goes for our entry point. So you can see here that I'm actually creating a, a G unicorn command, I'm passing the, the different configurations for that command using environment variables. But one thing to note here is that I'm not actually, I'm not invoking uh, uh, the MLflow model serve uh, uh, command. I'm, I'm running the, the G unicorn command uh, explicitly. And that is because we have changed the, the entry point of our server. We, cre we created a new entry point and we extended it with our middleware. And now we cannot call uh, our server and run it uh, through the MLflow API. We're just going to need to run the, the, the GUnicorn command explicitly. And, uh, and that's how it's going to work. OK, so next up, deployment. And the, this is like an example setup for what you might have and, and something that might, you might have in, uh, in production. Essentially, what we have is we are taking our code base and split it to our training and our serving uh, uh, code. And our training code is, is basically something that you would uh, uh, rather uh, see in every uh, training uh, uh, pipeline is basically data processing, cleaning, feature ex extraction, model training, and eventually uh, validating and evaluating your model. And if you're happy with it, you merge, you merge the code into production and you might want to schedule it to run weekly uh, on any uh, workflow session such as Airflow. And, and when this model is running uh, uh, in production, it's going to register the new uh, model uh, to MLflow. 
And on the other hand, we have our serving uh, code, which is composed of the build script you already seen in, in this uh, in presentation. Also our configurations. So which uh, ML flow models we want to load, which type of experiment we're running, uh, how many workers and so on and so forth. And when you merge that into production, you also been deployed onto uh, any container orchestration. It's, been, it's loading the model from MLflow and you're able to monitor and optimize your web server. Okay, so let's talk monitoring real quick. Basically, because we, we have added our Prometheus uh, 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 metrics exporter to our server, we've gotten a built-in uh, way for us to, to see uh, measurements, right? So another cool thing about uh, Prometheus is because it's widely popular and, and open source, um, you can actually import uh, uh, tons of dashboards uh, uh, directly to Grafana for uh, GUnicorn. And this is exactly what I did here. And, uh, and you can see that we got uh, uh, the response time, the average response time, and essentially the number of requests uh, for each uh, endpoint, which is essential and crucial that you have this type of visibility uh, to your production service and, and in order for you to understand how it actually behaves if you need to optimize it, if you need to optimize your model code, if you need to optimize your web server code, um, you would have to do it through a, a monitor. As it turns out, when we want to talk about optimizations, there are rather generic stuff that we can do. And, uh, and one of them is actually changing the instant types, right? So you might have a GPU intensive uh, inference uh, code, or you might have a CPU intensive inference code. You, you might need to change the instance type. And this is all made possible if you're running on any container orchestration, it's easy for you to swap in and out the uh, instance types, right? Same goes for auto scaling. So if you're running in Kubernetes, you might use an HPA for your auto scaling gear mechanism. And if you're using Nomad, you might use Libra. But the, the, the idea here is if you're running this entire thing inside of containers in production, you might want to use uh, the same infrastructure that you already have in place for your other uh, production services. But what if you want to have a, a finer control on how our server behaves, right? So uh, it's really, really simple in GUnicorn. So if you have a, a CPU kind of intensive application, you might want to increase the, the number of workers and it's easily, uh, it can be easily done just passing the number of workers and um, if you're going to use uh, more than two workers, essentially you would use the, the async worker types. And those workers are, are based on the Greenlet's implementation of uh, multi-threading in Python. So it's just uh, uh, behaves like a multi-threaded uh, server. And uh, the number of uh, recommended workers here is uh, if you're running on a quad core machine, it's just multiplying the number of cores you have by two and adding one. So just nine uh, workers when running in a quad core machine. But also, if you want to have a little more control, you can actually configure the number of threads each worker is running. So uh, uh, by just passing the, 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 also the number of threads with the number of workers, you can actually uh, control uh, uh, the concurrency of your applications. And I'll, I'll give uh, like a, a full uh, disclaimer, disclaimer here. I'm thinking that machine learning applications are most of the times so are probably going to be CPU and GPU intensive. So you might want to use uh, um, just increasing workers. But if you also have something that is IO bound or, or IO intensive, you might want to configure the threads. I would actually start off with just configuring the number of workers and then go and, and, and uh, figuring out how to use uh, uh, threads. And, and uh, also one of the most uh, common uh, uh, worker uh, threads you can use is the G event worker. It's also what, be, what is being used by the MLflow server uh, itself, right? So you can actually install that and it would be available to, to use. Okay, so let's talk about the alternatives. Uh, it turns out that ever since we, we did this entire thing, um, the entire service space has really upped this game, right? So Databricks just in the past uh, summit has released a, a built-in serving model within 
uh, the, the Databricks platform. So just by a couple of clicks in the UI, you just uh, take a model from a flow and deploy it as a REST API, and it's all uh, nice. You have your stage makers and, and Azure and uh, Converge IO, and you have a bunch of managed stuff that you can uh, actually try out. But eventually, it all comes down to what suits you best and what suits the entire infrastructure of your organization best. So wrapping up real quick here is we are understanding that the machine learning in production is hard, right? both on organizational uh, aspect and, and technical aspect. And MLflow serving is a really great and generic way to serve any model that you save in MLflow. And it also can be extended. So I think that the cool thing here is you can use middleware, you can use uh, uh, all sorts of stuff just to, to extend your server. And um, the entire code that you saw in this presentation is also available on GitHub. And I took a really simple uh, uh, pre-trained model, the VG16 model, uh, which is a scene detector model. And I just wrapped it with an MLflow Python model and you can see all the code there. So if you want to uh, check it out, you can go. And for Yapo, this was a game changer, right? So we actually decreased the, the barrier of entry for any uh, uh, machine learning uh, applications. It's really easy now just to have a REST API and every product can utilize it and, and, and call for predictions. And again, I cannot stress this enough. If you already have the centralized infrastructure in production running and, and uh, supporting your entire uh, uh, operation, utilize it also for your machine learning projects. Okay, so where to go from here? I'm thinking that there's a lot of questions that might uh, uh, come up here. How are you gonna A-B test? And, and this is also, uh, if you have an A-B testing mechanism in place in your uh, systems, you can utilize it. Maybe you wanna encapsulate the entire uh, uh, mutual code. And we saw that there's a lot of generic stuff that we can actually uh, uh, encapsulate. So you can also do that. Maybe you wanna have a dynamic middleware registration. So maybe each service is gonna have like a configuration and you say, I wanna have authorization. I wanna have Prometheus exporting. So just by adding these configurations, you, you get the dynamic uh, middleware registration. And think about continuous delivery here. When a, a training pipeline finishes successfully, it's just going to trigger a, a deployment for our service. And essentially, we have a continuous delivery. That's it. Um, I hope uh, you guys liked this session. And uh, if you did, don't forget to rate uh, the sessions in, in Databricks. And um, feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, and if you want to ask me stuff about uh, what you saw here, or maybe uh, what you can see in GitHub, and thank you so much. And I will catch you guys on the next one. Bye bye.